Um, if I had to describe myself, I suppose I'd call myself a multidisciplinary artist. I have had uh, extraordinary opportunities in my life to work in journalism, to work in film, to work in documentary. Um, my home is that I actually uh, began with a dance theater company in New York and uh, the, the movement and the embodiment of story is very, very interesting to me. Um, let me tell you a little story. Um, it's on my mind because of the creativity and captivity, which some of you may have seen, and uh, the, the show last night. And there's a section toward the end that is a jazz section, very interesting. And two of the pieces in that section were written by a guy named Harry Berry who was a, a British journalist. He was uh, fighting in Asia during World War II. He was captured, he was in, uh, imprisoned in Manchuria and then somewhere else and then Taiwan and then eventually in Omori. I guess because of the crowding, I don't quite understand this, but I guess because of the crowding and stuff, somehow the guy managed to uh, smuggle in a typewriter and he produced a newspaper, like inside the, the prison camps. <laughs> and he managed to move that to two different places, but they eventually caught him and, uh, and took it away and put him on very hard labor um, as a punishment. They wanted him to write, the, this was the Japanese, they wanted him to write propaganda, but he refused, English propaganda. And he refused, so he, he was really doing this terribly hard labor, one part of which was um, to unload the, the big bags of rice and the food, and they were doing that kind of work all day. This is uh, at, toward the end of the war in Japan, and the Japanese were starving. The Japanese were very hungry and in almost as bad conditions in a way as the prisoners. So Harry Berry, this British guy with an incredible sense of humor, he's the one who wrote those songs about, in Omari there's a new sensation, POW, you know, and he's doing all this stuff and they're putting on little reviews. This guy is sneaking off to which he can be shot with bags of rice, bringing it to the barbed wire and giving it to Japanese people <laughs> on the other side. <laughs> Okay? This is a story. Um, okay, this is a list. 9,325, 1,325, 2, 87, 427, 9. Now, do you remember the story of Amari? <coughs> and about Harry Berry. Can you remember that? No? You can't remember Harry Berry that I just talked about? Oh, just now. Yeah. Yeah. Just now, the story about the rice guy. I, I got and, it. Right, okay. <laughs> and that's there forever. And, you, and, you, and that's forever, <laughs> and you will remember that story tomorrow, and you will remember that story next week. Right. Could anybody repeat the list of numbers? And I used really small ones today, because I'm tired. I mean, you can't, because we're organized to take in information through stories, it, period. <coughs> Period. That is how we understand the world, is through stories and narrative. So that essence of things is part of just the neurology of uh, the, the way we work is there's a lot more work involved in casting out information than in taking it in. It's a selection process. That, so our senses are not overwhelmed by all the things that are always happening to us. The way we organize that material is in this story form. And then it becomes very precious to us. And while as a director and as someone, as an artist, my hope is always to materialize things and bring things really all the way through from hopefully something coming from a high level all the way down on the ground to be materialized. The way we cling to our stories is so, um, is so controlling of action that we have to be careful and we have to understand the nature of narrative and stories and what we're doing. For instance, somebody who flies a, an airplane into a skyscraper full of people, 
is someone who has a mythology problem. That guy has a story about his place in the world, what he thinks he's doing, what the purpose of that is, why it's so important he should do that. And he is very, very, very attached to that story. For me, I run a, an outfit called um, Mythic Imagination Institute. And so we work with mythology and the nature of mythology um, as sort of a ground base. And then use that particularly to uh, bring together a lot of new and evolving arts and also conflict resolution as a way of working with conflict resolution. So people get to tell their stories. The type of amazing forum, for instance, of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was a storytelling forum. The way that worked, just very briefly, is that someone who some very serious wrong had been done to, every effort was made to have the perpetrator of that, of that have to listen to the story of the other. And it was done in a very formal setting, but it wasn't justice. It wasn't about uh, meeting out justice. It was about somebody having to listen and hear the story. So that opportunity is the opportunity to walk up to the threshold of forgiveness. When the sins are very great, um, th th there's no, um, you can't push somebody over that threshold. You can't force somebody, and you don't want to force somebody to forgive. But I think when you offer up your story, it's the moment where you're asking God to take that on. Could this be forgiven? in me because I can't do it. You killed my son, I really cannot forgive. But I could offer that. I could offer it and I could offer it in openness that, that forgiveness could come through me and that something might be healed. So that, that process of the stories, um, it, it controls really all of our behavior. Mythology itself is wonderful because it's vetted through time. So thousands of hands have, have handled a myth before you really get it, and it's been purified, and it's true. I mean, one definition for myth is truth, and it's been purified into truth. What I think is interesting about our communication tools now, and for me, I, I don't know if this will happen in, in exactly the same way, but so that happens through, say, hundreds of years that you really get a very refined myth that speaks to a culture and forms communities. What I am interested in are the stories that form communities and why that is so. But now with the internet and all this kind of uh, ability to communicate, I think it is possible through the kind of crowdsourcing thing that we might be able to purify and refine stories sort of width-wise instead of through time. And if that is the case, I mean, there's very interesting things with crowdsourcing, like the sequencing of DNA stuff and all that kind of work that's been done. So I think that is a possibility for the future. And what that would mean is that the way we define our communities will change a lot. They won't be quite so geographical. Um, <coughs> At the same time, I think there's going to be a more bioregional um, aspect of this where people connect to the place they are. So I will stop talking and, um, and just say that's sort of my first take on this birthday.